Welcome everyone to another episode of the Love Approach Project Podcast. This is your host, Laura Gutierrez, and today I am going to interview someone very interesting because we are actually going to dive into a topic that we haven't talked about before, and that is Ayurveda. And here in Australia, we actually don't know yet what the benefits of Ayurveda uh, are for us. So my guest today is Julia Pomaskina. And Julia is an Ayurvedic practitioner and herbalist. She's been studying and practicing for the last 13 years. She's based in Sydney, and in Sydney, she runs her clinic, Sunrise Ayurveda, from where she sees clients. So welcome, Julia. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura. It's such a privilege to be talking to you about my love for Ayurveda and be sharing um, the goodness that Ayurveda has to offer, particularly in the modern world. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And uh, it's so nice to have you here. I have really wanted to interview you for a while, so I'm glad that, that uh, <laughs> this is happening. <laughs> Beautiful. But, Beautiful. Lovely. So, well, let's begin, Julia. I'd love to begin with learning a little bit about my interviewee. So I would love to know how you get into Ayurveda, why, and how it has changed your life. This is a very good question and it happened all very spontaneously for me as good things happen in life. I was traveling in India in 2006 and I was staying in the yoga ashram where a girlfriend of mine brought me to. And there was a lecture on Ayurveda there and I went to that lecture and it made so much sense. It's like a lot of things started falling into place. And I fell in love with Ayurveda and when I came back to Sydney again, um, by divine providence, I met an Ayurvedic practitioner who really helped me with a lot of Whoa. stuff. Back then. Wow. And then I went on, and then I fell, fall in love, fell in love with it even more, and went to study Ayurveda at Nature Care, and then subsequently um, to study with Dr. Jit at the Australasian Institute of Ayurvedic Studies. So it helped me immensely, and um, I can only hope that I can share my passion and love for Ayurveda and help people help to ease the suffering um, and help to help people to live in balance, good health, happiness, and joy. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. I just love how we never know, right? When we are going to connect to that uh, calling. And so in your case, it was in another country away from what you usually knew. Julia, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about what Ayurveda is and where did it come from? Um, that's a beautiful question, Laura. Um, Ayurveda comes from India and India has been a custodian of the Ayurvedic tradition for a long time, uh, for many, many thousands of years. But I truly believe that Ayurveda is non-Indian. It belongs to the whole of humanity. It gives us a set of rules um, and a set of... Um, regimes um, and paradigms for our health and happiness in this body, in this incarnation. So Ayurveda originally, um, the Vedas teach us that Ayurveda originally was given to humanity by the God called Brahma, yeah. who is considered the God of creator of this universe in the Hindu tradition, in the Vedic scriptures. So Brahma then passed this knowledge to the God called Indra, um, who is considered to be the sun god. And then Indra passed the knowledge to the rishis and sages of the old days, who then went and founded their schools of Ayurveda. They took that knowledge, they practiced it, they elaborated on it, they did their clinical trials, and they systematized their body of knowledge. Wow. That happened many, many thousand years ago. And in that time, it is also believed that humans were a little bit different in their capacity to remember the information than what we are now. So that was an oral tradition. The whole body of knowledge was passed on from the teacher to disciple in the form of shlokas or poetic verses. And the disciple would be able to remember these poetic verses without reading them just, you know, as an oral tradition. So the memory of these humans and rishis and sages back then was very, very different. Wow, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So we are nothing like that now. Maybe some rare people are, but not me. <laughs> so then about five, six thousand years ago, 
when the humanity started incarnating into a more denser, re denser reality and in, into a more material reality, it was recognized as a need to record this body of knowledge. Okay. Right? So sages of these old days, uh, particularly well-known sages of Ayurveda, Charaka, Shushruta, and Vagbata, uh, uh, who wrote the Ayurvedic scriptures, um, Charaka, Shushruta, um, and the Shtanga Hridaya. So these um, um, beautiful sages systematized the body of knowledge, and it was all written down. And these are the books that form the foundation of Ayurveda now. Originally, though, um, Ayurveda consisted of many, many branches of medicine. So in, in a way, it's not a modality. It's a philosophy on life. It's a philosophy how to lead our human lives in the most healthiest and happiest of ways. Um, accumulating as little karmas as possible and disseminating or working through as many karmas as possible from our past. Amazing. So beautiful. Um, so originally, Ayurveda um, was the first medicinal system um, in, of, of, of the time. And Ayurveda consisted of branches like surgery, organ transplants, pediatrics, ear and nose health, etc etc one of the branches was rejuvenation wow. um, and prolonging the longevity of life so many many branches of ayurveda later on a lot of these old texts were translated and they actually formed the foundation of modern medicine modern surgery modern ear surgery pediatrics etc etc so in a way um, it is believed that all medicine on this planet takes direct root in ayurveda Wow, wow. Um, but of course, nowadays, we don't practice Ayurveda in these ways, you know, and we will, you know, if you need surgery, you'll definitely go mainstream, you wouldn't come to see me. Mm -hmm. But what Ayurveda, <laughs> <laughs> but what Ayurveda actually does now, with the, and the form Ayurveda is practiced in the modern world, yeah. is, it, it's twofold. It's, first of all, uh, maintaining health, health maintenance, general vitality, general rejuvenation. Yeah. And second, um, eliminating the disease, eliminating the disease through the right diet, through the right lifestyle, through the right herbal medicine and detoxification procedures. So that's the way Ayurveda now is practiced in the modern world. And it gives us clear, concise guidance on what we should do to stay healthy and happy. Because health and happiness is the foundation of every human life. Which sometimes proves so elusive from us right now in the modern <laughs> world, right? Yes, yes, yes. And, and that is why, or that's one of the reasons as to why I started this podcast, you know. Because I see that we can, we can get there. We just need to... We'll have access to the information that can help us get there and then obviously take action, of course. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And, and just um, elaborating on that, the right knowledge, uh, the right action, and then um, remembrance of that right action so that it becomes unconscious part of your daily living is exactly what's emphasized by Ayurveda. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. I so that was going on. Yeah, amazing, amazing. I'm very curious because I have always, I mean, I have, I learned a little bit about Ayurveda when I was doing my health coaching course, but like very basic concepts. But today I would like to obviously go a little bit deeper with you because you're very passionate about it as well. So I would like to ask you, Julia, now a little bit about the unique concepts of Ayurveda. Because I know sometimes it's, it's, it's good for people to know a little bit about them, but obviously not to get fixated on that. Of course. And that's important. It's important to be aware. So the unique concepts of Ayurveda, um, and I'll try to give you a concise picture without overwhelming you with too much detail. Mm -hmm. The first theory, a unique theory uh, of Ayurveda is called Panchamahabhuta, or the five elements. Oh. And what it actually means is that um, the whole of the materialized universe um, including our earth and us as humans, 
in our material and subtle forms, right, um, is governed by the five elements. They exist within and without, mm -hmm. as within or without. Yeah. Um, so the five elements that we're talking about are ether, air, fire, water, and earth. And I'll give you an example of each one and some relevance to us as human beings. Ether. If we take the element of ether, space, ether is space. Things, us, earth, planets need to exist in space. We don't exist in some sort of a black hole walked yeah. into something else. You know, our reality needs to exist in space. Yeah, yeah. So what it means to our human body from a physical health perspective, for example, we need to have the right degree of the element of space in our body. For example, we need to have space in our stomach. We need to have sp space in our sinus cavities and intestines and our body exists in space as well. We need to have the right space around us. Too little of that leads to imbalance. Too much of that leads to imbalance. The next element is the element of air, Vayu. So the element of air, space is called Akash. You know, oh, space wow. is Akash. Um, so the element of air is called Vayu. As the element of air without, externally, so the element of air internally. The element of air is... The qualities of the element of air are cold, dry, rough, coldness, quickness, you know, subtleness, minuteness. Mm -hmm. So what it's represented in our body, um, and it's probably particularly relevant with regards to the conversation about stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. So the element of air is mobile, it's quick, it creates. Um, so in our body, it's represented first and foremost by the movement of our nervous system. The synapses, everything moves, you know, the synapses, quick, 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 the impulses go from the hand to the brain, etc., etc. So that's how the element of air governs our physical body. Okay. Too little of it, and we get dull. Yeah. We get uninspired. We sit on the couch, watch TV all the time, and wonder, is there something else to life? <laughs> too much of it, too much of the element of air in our body actually does lead to things like anxiety, worry, overthinking, too much in the head, not grounded, you can't get your projects um, moving or completed. Uh, so too much of the element of air is definitely an imbalance and um, dare I say it's actually a plague of the modern world as well. Yeah. Because we tend to stimulate our air by TV, shopping, doing, etc., etc. So, interestingly, <laughs> the element of air is also our digestion because per peristalsis is the movement, right? So, a direct analogy of the too much of the element of air, um, you know, you can imagine what happens to, <laughs> <laughs> to the digestion and the stools. Too little of it is not good either. Okay. So, if generally speaking if the prob if the person has a problem with peristalsis constipation uh, particularly when traveling you know all these kind of things there is an imbalance of the element of air in the body too much too much doing too much thinking um so that's hopefully you now that's a good overview of the element of air yeah yeah no very clear and it's very i love how you've explained with examples as well it's great beautiful then the next element, and we're getting in from subtle to more and more gross elements, is the element of fire, Agni. So the element of fire externally gives us warmth, makes things grow, makes things transform. The universe needs that element in its physical, but also in its subtle form to exist. So, so do our bodies. In our body, the element of fire or transformation is represented. Um, the seat of the element of fire actually is our enzymes in the liver and the pancreas and the gallbladder. It's transformation of the food okay. in our body. Yeah, that's the fire. That's our stove where we cook food. So yeah. that then it's moved on and assimilated in our body in the proper way. Yeah. Um, 
So too little fire, your enzymes are out, you can't, dig you can't digest your food properly. Too much fire is not good either. You know, too much acid, you get into the acidic stories, you get into high degree of competitiveness. So if you think of the fire and it transforms, it's ambitious, it's competitive. Yeah. But there is a level of that. Too much, you become too ambitious, aggressive, competitive, irritable. Too little, you are a couch potato. I'm exaggerating, but that's so that, you know, you get the idea. Yeah. So everything, everything has to come back to the middle, the middle part. The middle, yeah, yeah. So with very little fire, there will be a, a slow digestion, we could say, too. So the very, um, that's generalizing, and as with everything, it's best to get a professional advice yeah. rather than self-diagnosing, because slow digestion could be to a variety of factors, and uh, but generally speaking, too little fire. Uh, would lead to heaviness, stagnation, um, lower quality digestion. Yes, okay. that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Um, so that's uh, an overview of the element of fire. Yeah. And hopefully you get something out of that in practical terms oh, yeah. as well. Mm, for sure. The next element is the element of water, Jala. And the element of water, as within, so without, the element of water carries the nutrients, nourishes, feeds, makes things grow, you know. So does our body. The element of water carries the nutrients through the blood. The element of water um, carries the hormones, makes us nourished, makes us fluid, supple, we're not dry, <laughs> robots, right? <laughs> Um, the babies grow in the air, so the element of water is very closely related to female health, ability to conceive, um, female fertility, hormonal system. Mm -hmm. um, the babies grow in the water, so the element of water uh, in its purity in the middle path is very, very important for the right functioning of our physical and subtle bodies. Too little water. Um, you get your, the problems with the hormonal system. Usually females get um, um, a lot of female problems, particularly problems with conception, fertility, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. um, too much water. We all know what happens when we have too much water and we don't like that either because then you get, your body swells up, you get oedema. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is not a very nice feeling for those who experience that. I'm sure you would agree. Yeah. Um, so too much water is also represented in the body by too much mucus, uh -huh. by the problems with the sinuses. The, the mucus is basically overproduced. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. And then the last element that we're coming to is the element of earth. So the element of earth is directly linked to the structural um, solidity of our body, um, the right mineral balance in our body, the right balance of the elements in the skeleton. It gives us structure, it gives us stability and ability to move forward. Interestingly, people with a predominance of the earth element in their constitution actually usually form very good managers and administrators. Interesting. People, <laughs> it, it, very interesting. People with a dominance of fire in their constitution form really good salespeople, mm. form really good CEOs, ambitious, achieving, yeah. need, uh, really good warriors. They need to claim new ground. Yeah? Yeah. That's very healthy. Uh, people with a dominance of water form... Um, um, do their best in the nourishing professions, like teachers working with little children, nourishing, giving mothers. Yeah. Um, people with the dominance of air in their constitution. Air is movement, creativity. So they do their best in the creative professions. Yeah. They do their best, like dances, for example. They do their best in writing because the brains are quick. Everything works really quick. They do, uh, P, um, they do their best in writing, they do their best in advertising, for example, um, to any creative occupation. People with the dominance of ether or space, Akash, in their constitution, 
Um, so it's space, everything exists in everything. So these people are philosophers, they're thinkers. Wow. Uh, they're the ones who need to be left alone for two or three days and they sit still <laughs> in space, right? And nobody knows what they're thinking about. And then they come up with something amazing, an amazing idea that nobody thought about. Yeah. Wow. So that's how the Ayurvedic theory, it's a quick snapshot of how Ayurvedic theory of Panchamaha Buddha or the five elements yeah. uh, feeds into our real lives. I, no, what I is love it, Julia. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. That I just it's not only fascinating, but it's just reassuring, you know, to know that we are nature, part of nature, and nature is part of us, you know. It's that complete yes. um I, I don't know the word of this, but that connection, a total connection with and the we outside. forget about it sometimes, isn't it? Don't we? Yes. We forget about it, we rush with our little thoughts and um, and ideas thinking that that's us who's running our lives, but it's all our constitutional tendencies and the propensities and our tendencies to think or feel the certain way. Lovely. That yes. human. Yes. And whether we are aware of it or not, we are, as you said, part of nature. We are connect connected to everything. Yeah. Whether you're conscious of that or not. <laughs> yes, exactly. So better be conscious. <laughs> It's better for us to be now you frozen. Froze now and you're, you're froze now and it's interrupting. Ah, mm -hmm. okay. Can you hear me there? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, great. Yes. No, I was saying that um, it's better to be aware of how we are connected and how nature and us are basically interrelated. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yes, yes. And, and so, Julia, as part of this theory, um, does the theory, theory of the doshas refer to this or, or, or is it related to the theory of the five elements? Beautiful pickup. So Ayurveda has a, um, a, a rough classification of human constitutions, uh, which it calls doshas. Mm -hmm. So you might have heard of the words vata, pita, kapha, yeah. and wondered, or kapha. Or one, and wondered, what is that? Should I learn that to practice Ayurveda? And what reference does it mean to me? Um, the answer is yes and no. So I'll give you an overview of how Vata Pitta Kapha function in our lives and why the answer is yes and no. So Vata, if we talk about Vata, Vata, people have a predominance of ether and air in their constitution. Okay. So by definition, Vata people, um, um, air is mobile, quick, creative. So Vata people would be creative, mobile. Generally, they are the skinny people, people who don't put on weight easily, um, people who like to move around, who love to travel, who love to create new things. Mm -hmm. um, one of the translations of dosha from Sanskrit, one of the translations, is interesting. It means that which spoils. Oh. So what that means is that you have a certain constitution and the certain propensities to act in a certain way. Mm. For example, for vata people, or, or in other words, to use your energy in a certain way, vata people tend to experience uh, expend their energy. They get the energy, they don't hold on to it, like they don't accumulate weight that easily. They tend to spend their energy straight away. You know, spend the money, spend the energy, travel, do things, be creative. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what they value. Uh, why is dosha that which spoils? Because the propensity of this constitution is to overspend the energy too much and they become exhausted, tired, they're prone. Vata people are prone to anxiety, to nervous system problems. Mm -hmm. right? Very interesting. So, so that's why it's important to bring it into the middle. Yeah. Your doshic tendencies will always push you, you know, along the scale mm -hmm. of extremes. Yeah. So it's always Ayurveda teaches us that to be healthy, it's important to bring it into the middle. Yeah. Right? And we'll talk about a little bit later about the actual actual practical uh, strategies of how to do that. So now talking about the Pitta people. Pitta people um, 
um, have the predominance of fire in their constitution, fueled by some degree of water or oil. Right? Okay. Oil is uh, considered a watery substance in Ayurveda. Okay. You can imagine what happens when oil and fire get together. Bitter <laughs> so, um, people, um, as we spoke before, they love to transform. They love to spend their energy for the for the cause that they believe in. Let's put it this way: whether it's uh, money making or whether it's transformation of humanity. Mm. Yeah, it's a very pitted tendency. Um, so, pitted people tend to be very focused, very disciplined, um, probably the most disciplined of all the doshas. It's not that easy for a vata person to be disciplined, yeah. but it's much easier for a pitta person to be disciplined. Yeah. That's the purpose of their life, mm. right? Now, talking again about that which spoils. So, pitta people can focus so much on their goal and energy that they can just walk towards it, disregarding everything else disregarding their body, disregarding the loved ones, disregarding the sleep, disregarding self-care. I'm talking about extremes. Yeah. Uh, and ways it can manifest in their life is competitiveness, aggression, irritability, acidity, mm -hmm. um, uh, heat, too much heat in the body, um, um, uh, too much sweat, night sweats, etc., etc., liver and gallbladder problems. Okay. And pancreas problems. So that's the pitta um, package. Yes. Um, and every, there's nothing in Ayurveda is purely good or bad. Everything has to come into balance. Into balance. Mm. So and none of the doshas are better or worse than others. Mm. Uh, everything has to come into balance and you need to honor the constitution that you were given in this incarnation. That's what yeah. Ayurveda teaches us. Yes, how beautiful is that? <laughs> Stop the comparisons. <laughs> and then the last dosha is kapha or kapha dosha. Mm -hmm. So this dosha is composed of the water and earth. So it's very stable and it's watery at the same time. Mm -hmm. So stable, um, nurturing, nourishing. Kapha people are very caring. So a lot of healers who take care of others would have a large degree of kapha or mm. kapha in their constitution. These are the type of people that would usually have beautiful round um, almond big eyes that you look at and you feel very nourished with. Mothers. If you think of the motherly energy, that's pure kapha. Um, so it's, it's a very beautiful energy. Too little of kapha will give you instability. Mm. Um, possibly, you know, too little of water. We spoke about infertility and those kind of things. Yeah. Too much of kapha, again, is also very common nowadays. Too much of kapha will give you a lot of weight gain. Okay. Mm. Too much of kapha will give you lethargy, mm. will give you inertness, yeah. will give you inability to move with your goals couch potato you sit on your couch and you wait and wait and wait for things to change and they never change yeah 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 so if we talk about anxiety and depression and and stress a very loose a very loose um uh, association with the doshas would be that vata people tend to get very anxious and worry a lot mm -hmm. the people tend to get very stressed yeah. They need to achieve, they have too much on, they take too much on. They're, they're greedy, they're ambitious, mm -hmm. right? In a way, if it makes sense. And kapha people generally are prone to depression because depression is a heavier substance. Ah, as I said, this is a very loose definition yeah. Yeah. because even depression can be fiery or can be, you know. Yeah. So this is, this is just running parallels if it makes sense of course of course i'm sure that many people are asking themselves now so how can i find out what dosha or constitution i have what can they do about that this is a lovely question and um i will give you a little bit of a controversial answer controversial to 
a lot of information that you will find on Ayurveda out there in the books and um, on the net. Um, so are you, there are very few people who are pure vata, pitta or kapha. Okay. Usually a person will have a degree of everything, but one or two would be dominant. One or two of the elements would be dominant. Mm -hmm. So, um, and by the way, your constitution, or in Ayurveda, it's called prakruti or prakriti. Your constitution is what you're born with. It never changes in your life. Oh. It's, actually, it's actually defined already in the womb at the moment of conception. Wow. <laughs> yeah, some would argue even before that, and it never changes. But what does change is your imbalances in life, what in, in Ayurveda is called the kriti, right? So that changes all the time. And um, particularly in our modern world, when we have so many vata influences, mm. the vata, the mobility, the quickness, too much information, internet, movies, too much too much. Um, data, too much stuff to do, you know, yeah. all wax our nervous systems out. So in our modern day, some Ayurvedic um, teachers that I study with, they actually say everybody has that imbalance in our modern day. Anyway, it's just the, the, the nature of the age that we live in. Yeah, makes sense? So yeah. just answering your question on the relevance of knowing your constitution and and how can you apply it in your life that's why i said in the beginning um how important is it for you to know about the doshas yes your constitution is undoubtedly very important if you have a pitta predominance then you need to stay away from uh, heating substances too much chili drinking coffee and everything that heats you up and you need cooling substances and activities right yeah. you need to take on swimming rather than bikram yoga or hot yoga <laughs> you need to take on um in your food you would really benefit from celery cucumbers and cooling substances cooling spices like fennel yeah. right and if you have vata imbalances then developing and maintaining a routine in your life would be very grounding for you yeah and if you have uh, and if you have kapha dominance on your constitution or kapha imbalances knowing that and knowing that you should move you should get off the couch you should exercise daily you need to move your body you need to eat less ice cream or not at all you know <laughs> it's a, it's a cakes or bread yes or things, you know would be very beneficial for you so these are very practical but I don't like people to be bogged down in their constitutional tendencies because the imbalances um, can run your life also quite strongly. You could be a pitta person with a vata imbalance. That's where it gets all very confusing. Okay. So, yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, so basically, sorry. <laughs> so you need to deal with what's presenting in your life, regardless of your constitution. It's good to be mindful of vata, pitta, and kapha, going, okay, I have a vata, and, um, for example, I have a vata and pitta constitution. Yeah. So I need to be mindful not to overexert myself. I need to be mindful to take more cooling substances in summer, etc., cetera, yeah. etc. Cetera. Uh, but you also need to be mindful of your imbalances, and a lot of people tend to confuse these from my personal clinical practice. Yes.